Hello my bookish friends out there in booktube land and welcome to this episode of Tristan and the Classics where I'm going to share with you a book haul of classics which you may never have heard of or you may have heard of but never read and they're certainly classics which are somewhat beginning to be forgotten apart from one. So without further ado let's dig in shall we? The first book up is Lark Rise by Flora Thompson. This book is a bucolic wander through paradise. It's moving, it's evocative, it's nostalgic, and it will make you want to live in a different time. Now, a lot of you from Britain will recognize this from the BBC series, Lark Rise to Candleford. Um, you can get Lark Rise to Candleford, but it's actually three books. The first being Lark Rise, then over to Candleford, then Candleford Green. In the first of the books, Flora Thompson takes a look at the little village, British village of Lark Rise, at a point in history where the old 19th century, an entire way of life, is beginning to disappear and to die, something Hardy would talk about as well. And in this village, most of the characters are poor and you have the gypsies and you have the manual workers who sometimes go and get work at the local town. And you see a lot of the old ones bemoaning the change in the way of life. You see children playing old fashioned games. You see the community spirit. And Flora Thompson captures this because she remembers it. She was born in 1876 and she died in 1947. So she look at the world and how it had changed. World War II had just finished. And this is the perfect remembrance book. And of course, if you enjoy it, you can see how the times are changing with Candleford, the town down the road. Our second book is something you should read if you love swashbuckling and tales of daring do and high-flying romances. It is The Prisoner of Zender by Anthony Hope, and I really like the cover. Now, The Prisoner of Zender, you've probably heard of. It's a relatively short book, about 200 pages. Have you read it? It's a real romp. You know, it's got all the classic tropes. If you like Scarlet Pimpernel, if you like Scaramouche, if you like uh, Three Musketeers, you're going to absolutely eat this up. Um, so the story, Rudolf, uh, is it Rassenthal, if I remember correctly, he's a lord and he's invited over because he's related to see the coronation of the king of Ruthania, uh, Ruritania. And Ruritania is where Ukraine, Poland, top of Belarus, Lithuania, in that column, that was the old Ruritania. But when he gets there, the king is captured just before his coronation by his evil brother. I mean, what a great trope. And only Rudolf can intervene. Only he can sort it out. And so begins a great adventure, brisk moving as he tries to maneuver around his enemies, as he tries to evade being captured or killed. He meets a beautiful princess, of course. What would the story be without that? And um, yeah, how will it all work out in the end? Um, you'll have to read The Prisoner of Zender. This has captured the imagination of generation after generation. It is a classic, but it's beginning to become a forgotten classic. Now, the next classic in my haul I had to buy as soon as I saw it. This is a classic that really deserves raising back to prominence. And it is G.K. Chesterton's The Man Who Was Thursday. Now, going by the title, you would think that this book is about a man who's lost his mind, but that is not the case. This is a book of espionage and intrigue and daring do as well and fighting and shadows and a great bad guy, you know, like a James Bond Machiavellian monster. So in the story, you have a secret police detective called Gabriel Symes. And one day in a London park, he meets an anarchist, which was quite um, a motif in the late 19th century. You think of Secret Agent by uh, Joseph Conrad. Now, being introduced to this anarchist and taken into his trust, Symes uses his opportunity to infiltrate the Anarchist Council of Europe, um, which is plotting, obviously, the downfall of all the Western governments, etc., but he does very well while he's there and gets promoted to the council. In the council, the members go by 
the names of the week and Symes is called Thursday. But while he's there, he meets another person who is supposedly also a secret detective within the council, but something's not right. And then starts a chase across Europe. Gotta love a good chase, um, especially in the days where you can't just get zapped by a camera and people find you instantly on the internet. So he's being chased, he wants to outsmart his enemies, he gets quite confident in himself um, and with his trickery, but here comes the bad guy. He is the chief of all of the anarchists, and his name is Sunday. How will Thursday fare when it meets Sunday? You'll have to read it to find out a book that should definitely be back on Booktube. The next book up, I'm not going to show you the cover yet because I want to see if you can remember what it's about. The title is A Night to Remember. You've probably heard the title, but can you remember what the story is about? Well, I'll show you the front. Now that should give it away. It's about the Titanic. And this is a piece, it's not fiction, it's a piece of investigative journalism by Walter Lord, which many say has never been bettered. Because obviously the, the drama that happened in 1912 when the Titanic went down at 2.15 in the morning into the icy Atlantic Ocean, um, it's caught the imagination ever since, but Walter Lord was able to interview many of the survivors. He was able to check the records at the time, go to the court, in, um, court investigation into what had happened. And he pieces it together beautifully in a book 180 pages long. So it's not overly exhausting. He gets the thrill and the excitement and some of the quotes of the people he interviews is fantastic. One quote is actually on the back of the book and I'll just read it to you. Um, Jochen casually tightened his life belt. Then he glanced at his watch. It said 2.15. As an afterthought, he took it off and stuck it into his hip pocket. He was beginning to puzzle over his position when he felt the stern dropping under his feet. It was like taking an elevator. As the sea closed over the stern, Jochen stepped off into the water. How amazing is that? In fact, the opening paragraph is also good. Please indulge me um, if I can find it. High in the crow's nest of the new White Star liner Titanic, Lookout Frederick Fleet peered into a dazzling night. It was calm, clear, bitterly cold. There was no moon, but the cloudless sky blazed with stars. The Atlantic was like polished glass. People later said they had never seen it so smooth. What a great introduction to a book. Um, have you read this? Let me know in the comments down below. And does just the little quotes tempt you to want to read it if you're into sort of journalism and history and non-fiction? That was the, the next one. Following on from that is another adventure, but this is fantasy, medieval fantasy of the greatest known world building ever done in fantasy literature. And it's a book that is not forgotten. It's the greatest amongst this list or the least the most popular. And it is The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. Of course, I, I've read this multiple times, but I've given it away like loads of my books and lost it. So I've got it back so I can read it to my boy. Um, of course, the story, I think we all know, Smaug the Magnificent, the dragon that lives atop all of the gems and gold that have been hoarded by the dwarves under the Lonely Mountain, and how the, the sorry, I nearly said the widow, the wizard, Gandalf, comes across the Shire and finds one Bilbo Baggins and draws him into an adventure along with dwarves to get back to the, the gold and the Lonely Mountain and all the adventures that they go on, including the walking and the talking trees, and you've got Ariacnid in that echoing um, cavern. Is it a cavern? It's like a maze, isn't it? And you've got the goblins or the ogres that want to eat everybody. You know, all the most famous characters. And uh, still to this day, I still think The Hobbit is better than Lord of the Rings. Um, the ending though, I remember when I read it as a youth, the ending absolutely choked me. Um, you'll know what I mean, uh, referring 
to the battle. Um, but yeah, there you go. I'm not going to say any more. The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. The next book on the list is a book which you might be surprised to think of as a classic, but I certainly do think it fits into that category. Um, especially if you're in Britain. I don't know about my American cousins and European friends, but the BBC did a entire protracted series of, on the works of this author, particularly the saga that is this book and its following 11 books. Um, and it is a well worth watch. Um, as far as series go, it's excellent if you love historical fiction and drama. It is Ross Poldark by Winston Graham. Um, written, although the, the cover makes it look like it was something out of the 90s, it comes way before that. I think it started in the 50s, maybe. I know my mum watched the first series in the 70s. Um, but Ross Poldark. So Ross Poldark, in this book, he comes back from the West Indies as a gentleman. Um, and he comes back because, uh, not the West Indies, the Americas, he's been fighting in the wars over there because this is set in the 18th century. And he comes back home only to be disappointed. What he expected, the life he expected, isn't there anymore. His father has died. Um, the whole estate which should fall to him is ruined. The woman he loved when he was younger and left for the Americas is going to marry his cousin. And so... It's how he adjusts to that and sets to work, rebuilding his estate, rebuilding a life, rebuilding the family name. A lot of it focuses around the miners and the workmen in the area. I think it's a tin mine that he sets up and um, because this is set in Cornwall, renowned for its tin. Um, so that's how it goes. And he, he really develops an affinity with the hardworking common man as opposed to the society he should belong to. And eventually he meets this little creature at a fairground who's, you know, ragged and starving. And it's a little girl and he saves her and becomes almost her guardian. If I remember right, her name is Demelza. But anyway, this girl will change his whole life. It's just a vista of... 18th century life in Cornwall, which is the southwest of England. It's that long squiggly bit sticking out into the Atlantic Ocean. Um, yeah, this is beloved by millions of people, like millions of people. And if you like sagas, you'll love this because like I say, there's 11 more books to come after this. Um, Demelza grows up completely um, and you meet many others of the Poldark family. However, if you don't like sagas, Maybe, maybe give this one a miss because oh, you can be, if you know there's 11 other books and you've never read them, you feel like you haven't finished. So uh, if you're a saga lover and a historical fiction lover, grab yourself Ross Poldark and start from there. The final book on our list, number eight, is a book I have not read and yet holds a pivotal position in literature for one key reason. And that book is by an author I love, George Orwell, Coming Up for Air. So in this story, our protagonist is a man called George Bowling and he's married and he has children and he's pretty boring and he's a, um, an insurance salesman with an expanding waistline, you know, midlife kind of character. But he fears the modern world. The year this is set in is 1939, before World War II has broken out, but that panic is increasing and gripping Europe. And he fears the rise of secret police and government interference and surveillance and all that kind of stuff, which I'm going to come back to in a minute. It's significant. Because of this, he decides he wants to retreat from modern life by going back to the village where he grew up when he was a child, holding on to that country idyll, thinking it's going to be much more quiet. But when he gets there, it's not how he remembers it. Now, apparently this book is quite realistic, which is very much like George Orwell, but it's also very, very humorous. Apparently there are laugh out loud moments in this, something I don't associate with Orwell, to be honest. However, this is where this book has its power. In this book are the seeds, apparently, you can see the seed germinating for two later books of Orwell's Animal Farm 
and 1984. That's where secret police, government surveillance, um, fascism, communism, that kind of totalitarian idea um, is, is brought up in George Orwell's mind. And so by reading this, if you love Orwell or love those other two books, you're going to see how a, an idea germinates in the mind of an author and finally outworks itself later on down the line in books that, you know, are real, real magnificent classics. I hope that you've enjoyed this book haul that I've gone through. How many of the books have you heard of but not read? List them down below. Um, and which one out of all of them do you think appeals most to you? Tell me and give me a reason why. If you love classic literature, remember that you can join my Patreon group where each month we go into a book. The community is getting very good. We're actually doing a live Zoom tonight um, with each other. And... We dig into the literature. We, we go beyond the story into explanations of what's going on underneath, pulling characters apart, finding links between what was written then and how we live now, looking for aphorisms and truths that can still be applied, seeing the development of literature along the way through the ages. So uh, if that sounds good to you, come and sign up to my Patreon and uh, have a look around. It's already got like over a year's worth of videos which you will get instant access to. I'll leave the link down below. Until the next time, I wish you joy in your reading.